Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here on this sunny June day. We were just talking about how it'd be a good day to be weeding a garden, but uh, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, this is a MinStack monthly forum. My name is Ryan Murphy. I'm from the University of Minnesota. This is a monthly forum series that we put on in collaboration with the Minnesota Shade Tree Advisory Committee and the Urban Forestry Outreach and Research Lab here at the U of M. Just a quick reminder that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on our UMN U4 YouTube page, which I'll post a link to just in a moment. Uh, and if you haven't already, please do sign up for the MinStack uh, newsletter. And this is a place where we you know, provide all things announcements and information about all things urban community forestry. And you can sign up for that at minstack.org. I'll post those two links in the chat here. So our presenter today is Dr. Vera Krishik. Dr. Krishik is an associate professor in the Department of Entomology at the University of Minnesota. Her areas of interest include conservation biocontrols, insecticide toxicity, pesticide use and safety, and integrated pest management programs for pests in the landscape and greenhouse. So Vera, thank you so much for being here today with us. Um, please begin your presentation whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you for uh, joining me and hopefully at the end we can have some discussion. So uh, the title here is Integrated Pest Management, IPM, Managing Insect Pests and Preserving Pollinators. And uh, there are ways that you as applicators by choosing a certain pesticide or keeping track of environmental conditions can uh, reduce drift and help pollinate. So we're gonna talk about that and, and I added some fun things at the end if we have time to go through. But I always like to kind of mix in um, scientific stuff with fun stuff. And so beetles are my favorite just because they have those elytra that then there's all that sculpturing on there so you can get colors, either spots or stripes and they come in all sorts of form. But here is a bunch of beetles, the two, um, the ones, the yellowy ones, the, those are two different kinds of corn rootworms. And then one with the white stripes, that's a Colorado potato beetle. And the one with the red body and the black is a um, asparagus beetle. And they're all in the family Chrysomelidae. It says that at the bottom of the slide. And if you look at them, there's a certain body shape. You know, the head is little compared to the thorax, to the abdomen. They kind of uh, slowly, all the sections get larger. And then if you would look at the last one, the Japanese beetle, you see its clubbed antennae is opened. You see those five white uh, sets of hairs that identify it as a Japanese beetle, but it doesn't look the same. The head kind of doesn't, isn't roundy, doesn't melt into the thorax. The thorax is as wide as the top of the abdomen. And that's in a different family of Scarabidae. So, just remember, insect evolution is very conservative. And if you see something out in the field, try to figure out what it looks like. We use feet, antennae, the shape of the body like I just went through. Those are the different characteristics we use to identify insects to family. And as long as the label says that it does leaf, some leaf feeding beetle, you can use it on other leaf feeding beetles, but you couldn't necessarily use it on a Japanese beetle because it's a different family. So that is one of the major parts of IPM, is understanding what pests you have, and then you have to make a site-specific IPM program, as it says in the banner up here. So I want to go through first all the resources we've created. I mean, I get to talk to you here for an hour, and I probably could talk to you for a semester, like a regular course, for all us to talk together about what we just went through, all the different aspects of IPM identification, pesticide choice, pesticide safety, as Ryan said. So you're gonna see this slide now and then, it's just when I go to a new section on this, in the talk, I'll have this uh, banner slide, so you know we're going to a new section. So this is backyards for people. You know, you see those tulips there, you see a lot of annuals, you see a lot of exotic trees in the background, a uh, fair amount of turf. And the top one too is more a northern landscape with conifers. And, and then, you know, down in the back, it's some typical backyards, the people with the rock fetishes are still out there. 
and then people who have large barbecue areas. So these are backyards for people. These are backyards for the four Bs, birds, bumblebees, um, whatever you wanna call the, um, the rest of the group there. And what you notice the difference is the plants are touching each other. So there's hedgerows to hide in. Um, there's a lot of flowering plants that provide pollen and nectar in the foreground here. here you see some heirloom, uh, annual, some heirloom perennials, and you also see some uh, prairie plants. And when you look at the uh, garden and along the edge, you don't see so much uh, tulips and things, but you see more perennials, uh, heirloom or native um, pollinator plants that provide pollen and nectar. So. And then you see in the background that nice shed with the natural wood siding that a lot of the good bugs and the bees like to hide under uh, for the winter. So there really is a difference in management um, if you're installing landscapes for pollinators versus people. And there probably is a good mix you could come up with. Just remember that we are now understanding more and more there's about 350 species of native bees in Minnesota. Uh, we all think of bumblebees and honeybees, which is an exotic. Honeybee is a managed species like a cow. Bumblebees are social like honeybees and they're native, but we don't eat, grow them for uh, getting honey. We do uh, grow them. The major insecticides like culprit biobas do grow them now to be used in pollinating blueberries or raspberries because there's not enough uh, native bees out there anymore. So this is one thing you might see in Menards, you see nests or stem nesting bees. And I just wanna point out to you this second, if you can see my cursor, what you want is a structure, but you wanna replace these stems every year because as in any natural situation, the path pathogens, the parasitoids that attack, the native bees also build up in here. And so a lot of them don't survive if you don't change those stems. So um, we are, people are trying to retrofit their backyard. Remember butterfly houses don't work at all. Um, bird houses do work and these stem nesting bee houses do work. So it's, you can put it in any shape structure but make sure that you can change the stems. I love to encourage people to plant Campsus radicans and native here um, for honey, for, um, um, Hummingbirds, remember hummingbirds are our, are, is our only native um, hummingbird in the east. Uh, there's a number of different species. The ruby-throated is our only one. And they used to follow uh, the sap suckers. So sap suckers are native species that migrate. They used to follow them up. Sap suckers make holes in the spring and through the summer. And then when they come back the next spring, those holes, um, as the liquid comes up from the roots, um, as you know, if you do any trunk injections, that's when you use your trunk injection. Well, the sap suckers have figured this out through evolution, so they make the hole there already. And as the liquid comes up, it pools up. And so actually the hummingbirds depend on the sap suckers for migration and sap suckers are disappearing very rapidly. So please, if you work on landscapes, uh, try to use Campsus radicans, or then you see over there, a drop more scarlet honeysuckle. Those are the two best uh, plants. So I always like to talk about how we can retrofit landscapes for our, our not only our native bees, but our native uh, birds, especially hummingbirds, which have some critical energy demands. Also, when you manage metocoprid or emmectin benzoate are really good for ash trees to protect against ash, ash uh, emerald ash borer, but they're not really good if you use them on plants that these stem nesting bees use. So here's a leaf cutter bee. It makes those C-shaped holes. There you see the bee actually cutting it, which is a great picture. And then they put this inside a stem or inside a wall, and they put a pollen ball in there and they lay an egg in the pollen ball. So if they get that pollen from a tree or a plant that's been treated with a systemic insecticide, number of papers out there, absolutely that pollen ball will kill that larvae. Also, if they take a leaf that metacloprid or a systemic has been used on, that leaf as the larvae grows and feeds on it will kill the larvae. So really, um, we have a lot of management tools in our toolbox, a lot of biorational insecticides registered by the EPA. We're going to go over that in a second. And although a metacloprid or amectin benzoate are really great for certain sites, 
they're not good for other sites. Just, just remember that. And so you can spray on a plant like this, on a rose, you can use a spray of chlorothal nitropole. Trade name is acelaprin, which kills Japanese beetles, kills anybody else that's feeding on it, rose slug, sawfly. Um, but it doesn't affect bees, it's very bee friendly. So it takes a little more educational information through your pesticide choice to figure out what's compatible, but those options are there and that's my goal. Um, so I just wanna remind you that uh, here we have a picture of a native bumblebee, our only so really social um, bee besides honeybee, but we have, like I said, 350 odd species of stem nesting and soil nesting bees. Um, I have a picture of a rose there because we just looked at a rose leaf and lots of times people have these hybrid tea roses in their garden and I'm not so worried about imidacloprid reduce on them because do you see any pollen and nectar? I mean, the leaves would be a problem, but it's more these uh, shrubs, these uh, rose shrubs that uh, we grow a lot in Minnesota. The, those are the ones that the stem nesting uh, bees like to get the pollen and nectar from. So, you know, the open flowers like Rosa rugosa, the hybrids that have been derived from there. On the bottom, I just wanted to let you know that here we have a, a native bee that's um, making a nest in, a, in the soil. And then on the other end, we have stem nesting native bees. In the middle, we have wasps. And so really good to educate your clients or yourselves. You don't have to manage the ground or stem nesting bees, they will never sting you. They're only out there for about three weeks a year. But if you have a hornet's nest, a bald faced hornet's nest hanging from a bush, or if you have uh, vespid wasps in the ground, uh, you need to manage them. And if they're in a place that people frequent. Now, wasps have their ecological place. They're great at eating caterpillars. And so, you know, when tent forest is out there, these wasps do a number on them. So. Uh, in the ecological balance, all these insects do have a function. It's just when they might be a threat to people. So if uh, there's a nest in the middle of the forest where people aren't growing frequently, they have an ecological function and you should leave them there. So to have get all this information, we have three major places we put up information. There is a website on just IPM resources we're going to talk about today. There's an IPM and pollinator conservation website. And then at MNLA, I have various courses I post and a greenhouse a nursery course is gonna be going up there this summer. There is a course that if you hire somebody new who needs a pesticide license, they can take online a certification course. I've been teaching the only certification course for the MBA license for the last 15 years, the only course in Minnesota. So this was my original Q's website. It actually was written in HTML. That's how old it is. It's being discontinued. And this is the pollinator conservation website I talked to you about. And you see the buttons up there, IPM and pesticides, pollinator best management practices. It talks to you about all the different families of native bees that we've been talking about so far and research and then different online courses. So this is just from the native bee page I uh, just cut and pasted it. This is family Megacala day, again, stem nesting bees, family Helictidae, uh, green sweat bees, they live in the ground. And so if you've ever bumped into something that is fuzzy like a bee, but it doesn't look like a honeybee or a bumblebee and you've wondered what it is, um, the bees, this morphology, the color, the shape will help you uh, identify it to family. And Heather Holmes has written a number of five or six books on pollinators. And a lot of these pictures she let us use She's also gone through the website to make sure I got everything correct. So there are some bad players out there that people might take, think are bees. And so if you work as city forester, if you work on municipal landscapes or um, per, consumer landscapes, the way you can tell a wasp from a bee is look at these wasps. These are those murder wasps from um, the West Coast that they're trying to destroy the nests. They live in Asia and they're actually predators on honeybees. That's their ecological role. And so we don't want them in the United States. Just one more thing to um, put as the issues that native, that native bees have and honeybees have. But see, they're pulling the larvae out of the cap cells and the honeybees. And the way you tell their wasp is, look, there's no hairs. So bees have lots of hairs all over their body. 
I think you can see my cursor. They both have these elbowed antennae like the ants. They're all in the order Hymenoptera and the Hymenoptera have these elbowed antennae. But look, there's hardly any hairs and the wasps have a thin little waist and most bees don't. So those are the two easy, easy ways for you to tell if something is a wasp or a bee. And here's just some more pictures of these uh, um, giant hornets and just look at those mandibles. That could crush anything. It's just, so here is the compound eye. Here's three little dots, the single eyes. Here's these elbowed antennas, but it's those huge crushing mandibles or what they use to crush the honeybees. So rusty patch bumblebee, you know, if you're in Minnesota, it's as professionals. Uh, this has happened before where landscapers notice a bee and the telling sign for rusty patch bumblebee is this orange band. And again, you see they're hairy and they don't have a skinny little waist. That's how you know it's a bee. And they still have the elbowed antennae, but the character you want to use is the hairiness and the lack of a thin little waist. If you're doing a property and you find a bee with this darker orange band, there's something called the Bumblebee Watch, which is at my website, where you just type into Google Bumblebee Watch. You can take a picture with your cell phone and send it off and I'll tell you what bumblebee you have. But if you do, are managing rusty patch bumblebee um, because you're managing a habitat and it's in there, you need to come up with an IPM plan. And it's not that you can't manage, you just have to manage in a way to conserve them. This is the, the and I have a place on the website you can read about Rusty Patch. I was on the national committee for coming up with a um, white paper on Rusty Patch. But this is the ancestral home, the stripes. And these are the few places they're finding it. We do find them in Minnesota now that people are looking better but the amount of them is down. You know, you have to realize that this was one of the most, this and the Eastern bumblebee were the two most common bumblebees. And now it's, you know, really um, very critically uh, reduced population. So just want to remind you that you have a role too in Rusty Patch bumblebee conservation. So this is the other site that's for professionals. And we have all sorts of information on here. There's, this is where you go to find out if a chemical is registered in Minnesota. Copert, this is where you put in to find out if a chemical affects bees. I have a bunch of manuals here for trist Christmas trees. This is really important and you're gonna see it in a second. It's a bulletin I update all the time where I put in new pesticides and it tells you how toxic it is to bees and other beneficial insects. The IPM manual is online here, it's 2004, we're updating it now. So hopefully there'll be a 2023 updated online version, probably won't be able to print it, that's very pricey, but we will have it online. Here's what it looks like now. So there are pest profiles for over 150 landscape and turf pests and beneficials. And you just can click on each one of those downloaded on that website. We have posters you can print for the office to give out to your clients. Uh, this new butterfly gardening bulletin won an American Society of Horticultural Society award this summer for best extension. It's all about the behavior of butterflies. I writ the, wrote the first one in 1998 and I just updated it in 2020. And here is something about endangered butterfly species and bumblebees. There's the yellow banded bumblebee here instead of, and here's the rusty patch. Here, Carner Blue, Power Sheep Skipperling, the Scottish Shipper. And believe it or not, uh, they have put in for monarch to be uh, considered an endangered species because the populations are crashing. So up here, we have some information of how you can do IPM to protect beneficials. And that is inspect and monitor plants so you can diagnose early. As with any pest outbreak, make sure you look for biocontrol. So hence the need for that IPM manual to be able to tell what is a good bug, what is a pest insect. Uh, use forecasting. So, you know, we use phenology when spirea is blooming, look for lilac borer. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Have some kind of mental thresholds. Thresholds are a unit of bugs per unit area of plant. So for Japanese beetle, it's seven uh, for non-irrigated turf, and it's like 15 for irrigated turf. That's how many grubs, because remember, most insects only remove area. So removing, we saw that picture of that bee taking away area, that is not gonna kill that rose bush. 
you know, plants have leaves that lay over each other and that reduces photosynthesis. So plants are used to this. So if you lose some leaf area, you have a pathogen areified mite growing on a leaf, it may reduce the carbon gain from that leaf, but it's not gonna kill the plant. So just remember thresholds are just a unit of bugs per area that you can tolerate before you spray. Educate people, that's what it's all about. We've just been talking about how you tell bees from wasps, natives, bees from natives, wasps, educate people so they don't go around nuking bumblebees or ground nesting bees. And it's really important to keep records so that next year when you go back to a property, whether it's one of your municipal properties or the city forest or different areas, so you know what was the problem and you really wanna check if your management tactic, whether you did a cultural tactic or a chemical tactic, if it worked. And remember all of this can help critically endangered, endangered, threatened species. So you really have a major role in uh, beneficial insect conservation uh, through your job. So hopefully these two websites will give you the tools to uh, uh, perform that. So those are the resources. If you put my name into Google, they usually will come up. Um, and they're always at the end of my email. So if you email me and I email you back, you can find them there. So now we're gonna you know, go through a few more de details about pollinator conservation. So what can you do in an IPM program? Well, as uh, if you're retrofitting a landscape or installing plants, remember uh, you wanna use contact insecticides. Now, yes, I realize for some issues like ash, uh, emerald ash borer, absolutely you need systemics, hemlock, problems, hemlock problems down in the Smoky Mountains, they're even using uh, a meat of culprit there. So yes, there's issues where we need to use systemics, but in general, if you use contact insecticides that degrade very quickly, seven is uh, the trade name seven, S-E-V-I-N, is by Fentran, I can see my cursor here, and it's called seven because it degrades in seven days. And now the EPA has all these insect growth regulators that are very non-toxic to pollinators. And again, I'm gonna show you where you get this information. Don't use systemics unless you have to. Plant a seasonal phenology of native and heirloom garden plants that provide pollen and nectar. Remember, if something is a double flower, the stamens have been modified through selective breeding to not produce pollen, but become those second double flowers. You can sometimes see it if you look at the double flower, there's a thick line in the center, whereas the old stamen is, and then it kind of has a broader area. So that used to be the pollen producing organ. So you wanna use single flower plants, provide overwintering habitats. I once asked the famous Marla Spivak, what should I tell people? to have on their backyards or their municipal landscapes or parks or native bees. And she says an old, she says an old couch with a tree that fell on it. That is perfect bumblebee overwintering habitat. Um, don't kill queen bees. Without them, there's no population and they do not sting. Um, bumblebee queens would, would be really bad um, if somebody told you they stung you because they don't. Um, understand what you can do to, through your IPM management, your cultural management, your choice of pesticides. Like I said, you're in a unique opportunity here um, to actually help conserve pollinators. So this is just a summary. Use contact insecticides. Oh, don't use systemics unless you have to. And reduce herbicide use. And now this, most herbicides, if you look at their toxicity to bees and beneficials, they're not. But there are a lot of papers coming out showing that herbicides actually affect thermal re regulation in insect. They affect the ability of the insect to digest food. They kill the microbes in their gut. And uh, so, and promote bee lawns. Um, and don't use fungicides without diagnosis. Fungicides can be toxic to bees. So uh, remember these bee lawns, there's a lot of state programs on installing bee lawns and they can't be managed with herbicides because you'll kill off the bee plants. So we have to come up with alternative management using microbial insecticides and non-toxic um, insecticides. So we have opportunities here to help um, these uh, pollinators through habitat manipulation, that would be cultural management under IPM, 
creating food plants, not only for bees, but all the good bugs. Am I gonna talk about that at the end? All the good bugs, those parasitoids they release for emerald ash borer, they all need pollen and nectar to survive. So here's just three papers, older papers that I picked up. Glyphosate affects bee gut biota, reduces immunity, increases infections. Glyphosate alters bee navigation, alters the ability of bees to process spatial information. Glyphosate affects the larval development of honeybees, causing reduced weight and delayed molting. So these we call sublethal effects. So even though the toxicity of herbicides are not rated toxic to insects, we're finding they have major sublethal effects. In my own research, I used to, before the bee lab grew and they have millions of bees on campus, I used to do bumblebee experiments on campus. And once the ground crew was spraying uh, herbicides on the beautiful grass around the buildings, I didn't think much of it because the chart says it's non-toxic. And my bumblebees basically flew back to this nursery cloth that I have around the colonies and they all died. And that's when I realized there was something else going on here. And these adjuvants that are in chemical formulations can be very toxic. So that is an emerging story. So remember that um, fungicides and herbicides are not as neutral as we used to think they are. So the big issue is understand why systemics have this problem. And here is just a little bee flying around and neonicotinoids are the ones we usually talk about since they're the major class of systemic insecticides. There are a few other uh, systemics out there, but it's mostly the neonics and the mectinbenzoate, which we don't use on many things except uh, emerald ash borer management. So remember, this is Sanchez Bio 2014, a long time ago. He had this in Science, which is the most famous magazine for scientific research. And so plants only uptake two to 20% of the neonic. The rest of it goes into pollen and nectar or throughout the whole plant. That's why that little stem nesting bee, when it took a rose leaf, is going to have high enough levels in those rose petals or in the pollen and nectar to kill the larvae. The rest sits in the soil and it leaches out into aquatic situations. It affects soil insects. Also the seeds themselves when they're coated and maybe if they don't grow or when they turn at the end of a plot, there's a lot of data emerging. This is having huge effects on game birds in Minnesota. I just saw that the LCCMR gave another grant to the Raptor Center. They were collecting uh, dead birds when they're brought in from hunters and looking at liver and um, they found very high levels of neonics, enough to obviously kill the birds. Um, and probably their behavior was affected. That's a whole nother story. So we say these are non-target effects on um, beneficial insects, whether they're a bird, a bee, a hummingbird. And then there's direct poisonings, as I just mentioned, that the raptor center is looking at by ingesting these neonic covered seeds. So contact insecticides are the way to go. The, uh, you have to spray it on the foliage. The insects must walk or eat. Sometimes they're sprayed over. Toxicity can last three weeks at its maximum with something like permethrin, Astro Pro that has chemicals in it to make it last longer. But most of them last just a few days. And flowers that open after spraying do not. The thing about systemics is flowers that open after do. And I'll never forget in the beginning, there was a study that a chemical company did and the beekeepers asked me to read through it. And they harvested the flowers before the systemics were translocated through the plant. Because it takes about a week, just like when you put down, uh, uh, do trunk injections or do soil injections or soil drenches uh, with a neonic for uh, some pest on a shrub or a tree, it takes a while to get translocated. So it's the same thing uh, when you apply it um, as a homeowner or on some landscape plant. And so if you take the flowers early, um, they're not gonna have any neonic. The difference is once they get into those flowers, they can easily last six months to a year. And there's plenty of data that supports that, so. All right, remember on the label back in about 2000, we got this B label. And it's uh, only on foliar applications. It's kind of interesting. It's not on the soil applications, the neonic. But what it's telling you is that this chemical has the potential to affect bees. 
So I just want to look at this graph with you for a sec because it's kind of important. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you a chart that will allow you to determine whether a chemical in your chemical arsenal in your cupboard is going to be toxic to bees, beneficial insects. Remember, whenever I use the word bees, I'm also talking about parasitoids, predators. It's just a common non-target word to use. But this is an LC50 curve, and it basically means you put in a chemical at different dilutions. And then you look at the mortality. And remember, this is a lethal effects. So I was talking to you a minute ago about these sublethal effects of herbicides. And they're not even recognized in the EPA registration process, sublethal effects. This is just pure lethal effects. So when they determine the LC50, the lethal dose of a chemical, and here it says TD50, the dose required to produce a toxic effect in 50%. So this is called a logistic curve. So they give different dosages, you get mortality, you figure out when it kills 50% of the population. And that is the one little word that is used to rank the toxicity of a chemical. So as I said, there's a bulletin, it's on the website, I update it continuously. This is what it looks, it looks like. It talks about pesticide toxicity to pollinators, but read beneficials, parasitoids, predators, IPM systemic compared to contact, what we just talked about, how to manage with IPM, which we just talked about a couple of times. And here is the chart. So here the neonics, this is that actually LD50, the number of micrograms per B. And so all of these, look at this dose, imidacloprid 0.004 micrograms per B. You cannot see a microgram. Okay, let's just do it for a second. A regular aspirin is 320 milligrams. A heart health, healthy aspirin, those little yellow guys, are 80 milligrams. That's a milligram. That's 80 million nanograms. That's 80 million nanograms or 80,000 micrograms. You can't even see that. That's how much we would, that would be in a gram. So we're talking about levels that you can't even see and they are highly toxic. In gray are what is non-toxic to bees. So you see here, non-toxic, you see the number is much higher. And that is these uh, insect growth regulators, these juvenile hormones, a lot of the miticides. So there are ways for you to look at a chemical and decide if I use this, it's gonna be non-toxic to bees. As I said, the new one is this Grubex, which is, Trade name is a celeprin, the chemical is chlorothan and nitropol. It's used for Japanese beetle grubs. It's used for foliar for against, against leaf feeding beetles. It is non-toxic to bees. However, it does kill butterfly larvae. Um, but we see butterfly larvae much less on our plants that we're spraying than bees. So I still think it's a very important product. So just remember there's three kinds, classes of insecticides. Not the classes that talk about the chemistry, but artificial grouping. So bio rationals are what the EPA is registering for compatibility with bees and beneficials. Organic means it's OMRI, Organic Materials Research Institute approved. It's a natural product. It's toxic to good bugs. So most organic products, pyrethrins, azotin, spinosad, they are toxic to good bugs. Biorationals are registered to be non-toxic to good bugs. All organic products, it has to be a natural product, a plant product, a natural fermentation product from a bacteria or a fungi. Conventionals are what we just talked about on that chart. They're toxic to pests, bees, beneficials, um, unless the chemistry has been made like chlorothal and nitropol. Uh, on, in, on purpose, the chemical company is searching for something that is bee friendly. So just remember what organic means. Uh, sorry, slide skip. It's a practice governed by the certification board. There's standards. It doesn't mean these chemicals are non-toxic. So I'm going to skip over this. Here's some very big thing. Now you go into a store. It says all these things are organic, organic approved. And remember, it just has to be a natural product. So Bt, Bavariensis, Cydia, Pamela, granulosis, a virus, all these things. Um, and they do work well, but some of them, like pyrethrins, azotinactin, spinosad, also kill our beneficials. 
So what is the characteristics of birationals? They have a shorter residual. They are made to degrade by light water or microbes on the leaf surface. They work on the smaller insects, the larval stages, uh, less harmful to beneficials, whether it's a predator, parasitoid bird or a bee. They have low toxicity to us, to dogs and cats in the landscape. They may take a little bit longer, but they work really well. So just here is, there's a bunch of BTs out there and I just have this because I want you to look at this one, BT Galleria. This is the new compound out there. Um, it's called, if for grubs, it's called Grubbogon. And it is really good at um, killing Japanese beetle in the soil or on plants. So now we have a second chemical besides the celeprin. So these BTs, they're organically registered because they're natural products. But remember, you have to use a different um, one for different organisms. So Christaki is for moths, uh, Azaiwa is for moths and sucking insects, Tinebrianus is for beetles, Galleria is for beetles, Israeliensis is for flies. So even among these, the reason how BT works is there's actually a physical crystal in the powder that gets in the insect gut and lyses it. And these gut, these crystals are released at different pH of gut. So that's why you have these different um, strains of BT because the crystal works better in a certain kind of insect gut, whether it's alkaline or other constituents of that gut. All right, so we've talked about chemical choices. Now we're gonna talk about how to, um, we talked about cultural practices in the beginning, how to retrofit landscapes so they're pollinator friendly, provide plants with seasonal pathology of pollen and nectar for all good bugs, whether it's amaroid ash borer parasitoids or ladybugs, everybody needs pollen and nectar. And then we talked about chemical management. We've talked about uh, the different kind of chemicals that you can use. Now let's talk about how to put those together in IPM programs. We've talked about bee lawns are a big deal in this state, um, both the uh, Bowser, the Bureau of Soil Water Resources, they have a big IPM program, the university has been involved in it in years. And we're trying to get away from these monocultures and try to create polycultures where you have different flowering plants to support not only bees, but our other beneficial insects. So what is IPM? IPM is a decision-making process utilizing many tactics. It's a risk reduction system. You're never gonna totally get rid of your pest. You're just managing it. It's information and educational based. It's biologically based. It has to be cost-effective. And look here, it's very site specific. So every pest has a different IPM program. You use multiple tactics. We talked about here, cultural management. Um, using nectar plants, retrofitting habitats so they're more supportive of beneficials. We talked about biological controls a little bit. We've talked about biorational chemicals and alternative to conventionals. Remember, always use the least toxic pesticides. And your goal as a landscaper or a nursery manager is to conserve these good bugs so they um, manage the pests for you. This is one way you can scout little pieces of white paper. You stick it under something, you shake it. Uh, he's shaking here, uh, looks like a little spruce tree to me over a piece of white paper. In Maryland, where it rains all the time, and I'm from, we carry around white umbrellas and we just open them under the plant and then we shake it and we look at. Um, and again, you have to be able to ID what is the pest, what is the threshold, do I need to manage it or do I have enough biocontrol so it doesn't need to be managed. And I just write it down on my weekly report. And the next week when I go out and scout, I read my report, go back and see if the pests have increased. If they haven't, then your bowel control is working. One thing that we can do in landscapes is test. I uh, use the plant clinic to diagnose disease. A lot of times people say it's Japanese beetle and it's a fungus, it's a fungus I promise you. Um, so don't over fertilize. Uh, manage pests with the principal IPM and culturally manage the landscape so it supports beneficials. Spot treatments, get away from broadcasting treatment. So if you have a bee lawn and you want to get rid of the plantains or some thistles, they have these sponges now which uh, release herbicide and you just tap it on the weed you want to kill. Uh, the Germans use flamethrowers, which I think would be kind of fun myself. 
So uh, they uh, just bird out the weed that they don't want and then kill, keep the beneficial plants. Remember, if it's more than eight miles an hour, you're not supposed to spray. The MDA says you're supposed to have an anemometer to measure wind speed because that creates drift. And we know the whole thing with dicamba drift that went on. And so now dicamba can't be used after a certain day in May because it drifts so much, especially in hot weather. Spray less often, tolerate more weeds, use contacts, save the money on herbicides by retrofitting the landscape, use top dressings, use millorganite, add some of those uh, new products out there that are called soil amendments. Um, stop using herbicides as much as you did. It's, um, that is my goal in life, is to make people realize that we are from ag where you need herbicides because you're not gonna get the yield that you need to support yourself as the farmer. We don't need that in landscapes anymore by culturally managing grass, by using the right variety, um, by using soil amendments and the right fertilization regime, we can keep thick, healthy grass and we don't have to use as many herbicides and promote bee lawns and decrease herbicide use. So here's the name of this acelaprin, chlorothalonitrophil that's in GrubX. So if we go back to that table, spinosad, if it's dry, once it dries, it does not kill bees. It's great for caterpillars and sawflies. Sawflies, yes. We used to have sawflies in Minnesota. You hardly hear about them. I've been here 30 years. And it's because that Asian ladybird beetle loves to eat them. They also ate up all the elm leaf beetle larvae. So it's out there working for us. If we can serve Asian ladybird beetle, they do a great job for us. Neem oil, soaps, and oils for aphids work just as well. Uh, you need imidacloprid or diatofuran for borers. But we're going to talk about that in a second because it doesn't, the neonics. So these are two neonics, imidacloprid, diatofuran, two different chemistries. They don't work on borers, but you need them for emerald ash borer. No question there. So here's the order Coleoptera family Scarabidae. We talked about this in the beginning. So you look at it and you say, oh, it doesn't look like a leaf eating beetle. There isn't that really clear head and then a nice round thorax. The thorax kind of merges. And then you see those white tufts of hair. The larvae are just growing in the soil. And this is a mating ball, the adults uh, mate. Uh, remember we have bill bugs in landscapes. They have no legs. You manage them differently. They come out at different times of the year. In, um, when you buy a nursery plant, from the east especially, you get black, black vine weevil. The adults come in the bottom of the pots. The larvae also are legless. So remember, Japanese beetle only feeds on grasses. So if you're having a problem with some of the plants uh, in your landscapes that you're managing, it's, I can promise you it's not Japanese beetle. It may be some other insect. And that's why ID is so important for IPM. And that's why you have to come up with site specific. So here's Japanese beetle, they feed on the pollen, they feed on fruits. Um, they're a big pest here, July 8th, July 18th, the linden tree. Um, you can use traps to figure out when they're out there to spray, but you wanna take it down because this lure, this is rose smell, and this is a pheromone. So it's the pheromone and the rose scent. Um, it attracts so many beetles that they miss the traps and go into your landscape. So you don't wanna put it up to try to manage them. But again, here's this, uh, they're called anthrodilic dianides. And that's this acelaprin, which is chlorothan and nitropol that's in GrubX, but you can also spray it. Um, here are the two neonics, imidacloprid, clothiandin, thiamethoxin, thiamethoxin, We talked about their non-target effects. And so they should be used when you need it for borers or something. But if you can manage with bioreational chemicals, then you should. So here's this grub brigon, this new BT gallery I showed you back there in that uh, when we we're talking about the different uh, kinds of BT. And it kills Japanese beetle, Asia, June, Oriental beetles, all the different grubs. It's effective also on larger beetles. So I just bought a bunch of it to do research. I have a research project right now where I'm looking at biocontrol. I've, um, there's biocontrol of emerald ash borer releasing parasitoids that attack uh, the larvae in the trees. I'm looking at Japanese beetle uh, pathogens in the soil. The MDA released uh, Japanese beetle pathogen Tiphia vernalis. 
um, a, a fly, a uh, hymenopter, it's a wasp, an isocheta fly. They were active in Massachusetts and Connecticut. They did not work here. Um, and so we're now looking at, so here's a picture of it. Here's the wasp. They lay their eggs on the grub. There's different species. These are different species put their eggs in different places, but that's basically what the wasp, again, it's a wasp, has a thin little waist and has no hairs. That's how you know it's a wasp. Um, so in the Northeast, you can find tiffia. It needs to feed on flowers. It needs to feed by streams. In China, it's work, it works, but it is not working here in Minnesota. And here is the fly, Isocheta. Um, it was also released, the eggs are laid on the neck, the thorax of the Japanese beetle. And again, that's not managing. So we're looking at this fungus over the Sicula populi that lives in the soil. We're working with Michigan State University. They get about 25% uh, of the grubs in Connecticut. The Japanese beetle have this pathogen. It lowers sublethal effects. It lowers overwintering. It lowers fecundity. And we're working on a long-term project to release over vesicula in Minnesota. It's been released in five other states. So you'll hear more and more. So I promised to talk to you about clear wing borer and we're running out of time. So I wanted to get there. So here is a clear wing borer. You never see adults. They sit on the side of trees and it, they look like moss to most people. So look at this thing, even the antennae here, they're long antennae. And you might think, oh, this might be a wasp or a bee. It's trying to look like a wasp with this yellow, yellow um, abdomen. But look, there is no constriction like you would see in a wasp. You don't have elbowed antennae, you have butterfly antennae. So this is a clear big wing borer. It's actually a moth in the family Cecidae. They lay their eggs in cracks from weed whipping, from lawnmower hitting trunks, frost cracks. And they're on many species of trees. And this is what it looks like. They get, they have no legs. Again, most borers don't have legs. And this frass that they make from chewing on the wood and then it mixes with their um, feces, it's called gamosis. It sometimes is orangey. So most borers, beetle borers, the frass is white and dry or brown and dry. With the clearing bore, as you look at where the soil meets the stem and you see this gamosis. And this was my job as a kid. We had peach trees, little peach orchard. And I would go out with a knife and expose the grub. And back then you pulled it out. But now you can spray stuff on there to kill them. Um, you can also put nematodes work really well. You can spray nematodes on the trunk. So these family Cecidae clear wing borers, they're on everything. Uh, you've got to look for that damage. Here's a plant that's been pulled up. This is typical damage you'd see on a lilac or something. This is where the frass would start, but then it gets gummy like this in the rain. Here's what the larvae look like. They have very reduced legs. Here's a dogwood borer. Again, it's trying to look like a wasp, but it's not going to fool you. No elbowed antennae, no constricted waist. Most of them have one generation. They come out early in the year when Pusithia is in bloom or uh, bridal leaf spirea is common in Minnesota, but they also come out all year long. So it is really hard to control the adults. I would say impossible. There are pheromone traps, but again, they call them in. So what you have to look for is those cracks in the bark. Nematodes work really well. You can use a conventional insecticide, I would not use the systemic. The neonics do not work on clear wing borers. The chemistry, the chemical companies would tell them, you, you them themselves that the neonics, the chemistry does not work on borers. So you have to either use something like the nematodes. There are parasitic wasps out there. They rarely control them um, in nurseries and things. Uh, the arboretum, which has a lot of viburnums in their collection, um, has a lot of clear wing borer problems. There is something else called Zimmerman pine moth, which does something very similar. It gets usually where the branches come off, you find them under the surface, but it's only on pine trees. There is a clear wing borer on pine trees too. So you've got to sort out which one you have, but uh, I've seen this one quite a bit at the Arboretum. And again, you can use the nematodes, you can use chlorinella nitropole. 
Um, again, for the conventionals, I would not use the neonix. I would use a pyrethroid like a pyrethrins or, pyre or a pyrethroid. That's what the adult looks like. Um, it's been very hard for people to forecast when to look for Zimmerman pine moth. And we find there's a complex of about five different species that come out at different times. But they all overwinter under the bark and that's when you wanna get them. And here's that same picture. Look for that damage. And again, any kind of borer, it will, by you know, severing the foam and xylem tubes, you just get a section of the canopy that starts to die. And you guys all know if you get the whole tree dying, it's some kind of abiotic issue with the roots. Um, I just want to do one. I thought, well, if there's some turf people here, I got to give them something new. And so this is a leather jacket. It's a kind of crane fly. It's a fly. It's common in Europe. There's two species of them. They're more common in the Pacific Northwest. Sorry about that, where there's more moisture. This is the adult. It looks like those uh, big mosquitoes, the yellow mosquitoes on your ceiling in the summer. They lay eggs, the larvae overwinter is third instar. They feed in the spring again, then they pupate. In midsummer, the adults come out in the cycle. And sometimes they rip up a lawn like here. Um, so it's a rare pest in Minnesota. It needs irrigated turf. And so here's just another depiction of um, the larvae overwintering. The larvae are lay, the adults come out in midsummer, the larvae overwinter. And so your management is probably going to be in the second year in the spring if you have it. So just wanted to show you that Japanese beetle isn't everything that kills the soil, uh, kills the roots in the soil. There are other things out there. So be aware of that. Look at that. Looks just like one of those, uh, what you think is a big mosquito. It's a family tapula day. It's not a mosquito, but it looks like a big one. All right, I want to go now go here. I skipped over that one. I just put in another fly, um, this uh, spotted swing Drosophila. Um, here is just some data of it spreading. It's absolutely here. They use, it's attracted to fermentation products, beer, alcohol. And this is what a little crate of strawberries looks like after the spotted wing Drosophila. It's a big problem in Minnesota, but there is another insect fly pest. We haven't traditionally had a lot of fly pests in Minnesota. So the last thing I want to talk to you about some fun. I don't, I have about five minutes. I want to talk to you why these systemics are such an issue. So here is this Rosa rugosa I thought to, talked to you about earlier. And here's a tea rose. And this is what evolution made roses to look like. They have lots of pollen and then nectar in the center to feed beneficial insects. This is what man made a rose into so that there's no pollen and nectar. So that's why if you use a neonic on a, sh a shrub rose, it's gonna be an issue. This is a rose or a ghost of shrub rose because you're gonna, it's gonna get into the pollen nectar and kill whether it's a beneficial or a bee. But I'm not so worried on bees because nobody gets in there. The Japanese beetles actually make a hole through all the petals to get to the pollen. So here is a bee and they have these corbicula and through evolution, these have evolved to store hairs. So when you have this, this is called a co-evolution. You have the bee has evolved a structure of hairs and all different species of bees have different structures. Some are on their stomach, some are on their legs, some are on their, their wrap around their body. But that's called co-evolution when you have the evolution of morphology to help a bee. And so there's no question that insects cause the evolution of flower display, the color, the form. So here is a primitive insect, one of these things you'd find in your basement. Remember, insects started to crawl on the land 444 million years ago. Life on earth is only about 550 million years old. So they were out there from the beginning. You find insects um, were out there. So here we have the different periods um, here's the periods, here's the eras. We have the different periods of geological time. And here, all the way in the Cretaceous, the last dinosaurs were around, you have the evolution of flowering plants. The insects have been out there for 300 million years waiting for those plants. And so every flower display has been a result of a co-evolution with an insect. Here is a fly to look like a wasp. You're not gonna be fooled though. Look at those little Aristate antennae. 
not elbowed antennae, no little skinny waist. Here's a dog bane beetle that feeds on dog bane and sometimes the squeepiest milkweed. Here's a hawk moth. Look, these have been evolving all this time. So when plants came out, flowering plants 146 million years ago, these guys were out there. These are the plants that go from the angiosperms to the uh, older plants. So cycads had a cone, tulip poplar has this little tulip-like flower, but it's very much like a cone. And from there, from the gymnosperms, the conifers and all the cycads and the ginkgos, we get flowering plants that insects made all those flowers. So here's a hawk moth again. Here's our little serpent fly on a willow catkin. Here the flower is changing color. It's telling the pollinator, I've been pollinated. The petals change, they get duller. So the insect doesn't bother visiting them. We have this very tight convolution with milkweed and monarchs. Here are these double flowers that man created. The stamens are created into petal. Here's nice coreopsis with simple flowers. Here's this composites, the sunflower. They've taken this evolution to a whole new direction. These in the center are hundreds of little flowers that open every day. And these ray flowers make it look like to the pollinator and to the human eye, like it's just one flower. So this is what coevolution is. And if you put a systemic insecticide into pollen and nectar by applying it to the plant, it's not only affecting, it's getting into, I've got research data I'm working on publishing, it's getting into the flowers, it's getting into the berries, and it has effects on seed eating animals, flower eating animals. So systemics have a really important place in the landscape. But all good bugs have evolved to feed on pollen and nectar, even mosquitoes. And so systemics are a problem if we want to conserve insects. So I want to leave three minutes to talk. And uh, uh, sorry, I took up so much time. But it's been a real honor to talk to you guys and to talk to you about ways to change your management to conserve uh, pollinators and uh, birds and bees. Wonderful. Thank you, Vera, so much. Uh tons of information there. And I, I did post the links to your websites in the chat. Right, yeah, thank you um, so everyone, please take some time and explore all the resources Vera has put together for you all. So we do have a couple minutes. There's two questions in the chat. Um, maybe I could read them off for you, Vera, if that works. Yeah, I'm trying to look that banner disappears now and then. So okay, well, let me let me oh, just I've got the chat here. Okay. For basswood, is it okay to use this foliar spray for Japanese beetles before the flowers emerge? So I would like to ask you, what are you spraying on basswood so early in the season that you need to spray it? I don't know of anything that's out there. So, um, and it's a big tree and that if you spray it, it's a little tree, but if it's a big tree, it's just gonna fall on top of you, which brings up a lot of safety concerns. So please give me more information about what you're spraying. Remember, IPM is very site specific, so I can't answer that unless I know what you're trying to manage. So give me some more information, please. So those are the two questions. The other uh, one says, thank you. The, there was one, uh, there's one from Robert here a bit earlier. Um, oh, here, I see them up here. Are ash are primarily wind pollinated, aren't they? How many visit, insects visit ash? Most professionals are active in Benzoate for EAB. Does that impact others than EAB? So the thing about our ash trees, we use most ash we have in urban environments are a strain that is, uh, it doesn't, it, it, it is uh, seedless, we have seedless ash. So what does that tell you? It doesn't make uh, fruits. It doesn't have female parts. They have male parts, but that uh, ash flower gall midge, practically every ash tree has ash flower gall midge in the male parts. So unless it's, uh, tree in the forest that isn't a cultivated ash tree that wasn't purchased. They're usually seedless, so it really doesn't matter. But, and we're not using a lot of that mechabenzoate in forests where you have native ash. So um, yes, and mechabenzoate will kill silk moth larvae when they feed on the leaves. It will affect those, uh, what we say, charismatic, beautiful silk moth larvae. So yes, it will affect anything, but when we use it in urban environments, uh, I'm not so worried because we use seedless ash. And then the second part of it is that ash pollen is most 
unpreferred by B. So if something else is around, they much prefer it. I hope that answered your question. Okay, I found another one. Uh, it would be permethrin around the time that Japanese beetle emerge and start to feed. So Japanese beetle don't emerge until July 1st and ash and basswood is done flowering by then. So um, permethrin is the most toxic pyrethroid. It has the long, the longest lasting activity. So no, it's not gonna kill anybody who visits a flower if the flowers are not there anymore. So that's true. So yes, permethrin, you could go with carbaro that decomposes in seven days and still kill Japanese beetle. You could use chlorothal and nitropolisoloprin, which would kill Japanese beetle. You could use grubbagon, bacillus thuringiensis galleria, which would kill Japanese beetle. So I might not pick the most toxic pyrethroid because it's safety too for you as the applicator. So you might think about options. Well, Vera, thank you so much for being here in respect of your time and everybody else's time. We're just after 11, so I will call our forum to a close. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And um, Vera, again, really appreciate all the information and um, you jumping in and participating in this. Thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. And we will uh, see you all soon. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Ryan.